I'll start by thanking uh, Petar and Nathan for organizing this conference, uh, but also uh, to all of you uh, for your participation and papers and uh, brilliant comments that really uh, will shift my paper in somehow different uh, direction. Um, I want to especially uh, thank or, or mention uh, Greg's great paper on uh, yesterday, but also a paper on speculative romanticism, which is, I think, one of the best writing on the relationship between uh, uh, work of Cantamassu and romanticism, well, uh, literature in general that I've encountered. Uh, and uh, uh, Naomi and uh, uh, Julie on uh, yesterday's uh, um, uh, paper and uh, comments afterwards, uh, which are directly relevant to the things I will be talking about today. I changed the title of uh, today's talk from uh, this one. I won't be talking about Krontops at all. Or button, uh, and uh, this is the new title. Kant has some relevance here, and I will start <laughs> on a fictional theory of Kantam Yasu and a theoretical fiction of Luca Beckhardt. So I'll start by commenting on this uh, title. So uh, this title is uh, uh, has its origin uh, in the work of Konstantin Raudiv. Konstantin Raudiv was a, Lat a Latvian doctor. Uh, he had been conducting experiments in communication with the dead and had established contact with them by a technique called electronic voice projection, or EVP. It wasn't a real-time interactive communication. You asked your questions and then left the tape running, recording silence. But listening back uh, to the uh, Martian statics, you could sometimes uh, just uh, make uh, out people speaking. One time, the isolated voice uh, from the other side purportedly said uh, to Raudiv, Kante Pustiak, uh, which uh, translated uh, from the Latvian would mean, Kant does not have any relevance here. <laughs> Raudiv is a powerful <laughs> Yeah, So you find yourself basically with a Ouija board, and you uh, summon the ghost who wants to talk about transcendental aesthetics. So <laughs> this is. Uh, it happens. Raudiv is a powerful background presence in the series of uh, magnificent novels by Luca Bekovac, a truly great novelist uh, whose work will be subject or uh, one of the subjects of my talk today. So, let me start now with a proper introduction. <laughs> How to conceive of the relation between science, literature and philosophy? Let us look at the way in which Max Frisch confronts this problem in the novel Homo, Feb, Homo Faber. Its protagonist, Walter Faber, is a man of, fir, uh, of firm convictions. As an agent of techno-science, he has learned to see things as they are. Faber, in this sense, resembles the, the machine that, at least for him, represents a pinnacle of rationality. The machine has no feelings, it feels no fear on, and no hope, which only disturb, it has no wishes with regard to the result. It operates according to the logic of probability. For this reason, the machine perceives more accurately than a man. It neither speculates nor dreams, but is controlled by its own uh, findings in the feedback loop and cannot make mistakes. The machine does not require speculation. It does not have a need for fiction, nor has any use for literature. By its own admission, Faber cannot read novels. Frisch's story is composed as Faber's voyage through Europe as a kind of intellectual anti-pedagogy which ends, ends in Greece at the place of the, of the dawn of Ting. In one of the book's final episodes, we find Faber in, the com Faber in the company of his other daughter, Sabbath. While uh, waiting for the daybreak at the Acropolis of Corinth, they are wasting time by playing the game in which the point is uh, given to the player who suggests the image fitting to the scene they encounter. Although they, uh, he plays valiantly, Faber is short of victory by, lar by a large margin. Still, as the ga game progresses, his comparisons are getting better and better. 
The whining of a donkey reminds him of unoiled brakes, the morning air of a cellophane with nothing behind it, and the first rays of the sun over the sea of the crack in the glass, a monster's, or the photos of electron bo bombardment. In the short interval before his demise, Homo Faber becomes Homo Ludens. Without forgetting uh, that which, uh, which science uh, has taught him, he can feel wonder and marvel before the reality, and it is disclosed to him in a new way, and he, one can claim, becomes a philosopher. So, uh, I'm going to talk about <coughs> one fiction, a fictional theory of Kantamansu. Frisch novel shares the intellectual pathway with the 20th, uh, 20th century continental philosophy. The science, which proceeds on the basis of measurability and repeatability, fundamentally is associated with calculating thinking, with instrumental domination of the world. Technology as calculating thinking is the condition for the inception and development of science, and is indeed part of its very nature. Within this picture, of, uh, the science, or techno-science, is somehow opposed to literature and philosophy, which is there to think uh, um, uh, through their relation, is more often inspired by and allied with literature, especially poetry, than the science. Heidegger wants to speak that which uh, is poetic in poetry by translating it into the language of philosophy, his own philosophy. If one does not accept the basic tenets of Heidegger's philosophy, or one is simply unfamiliar with it, so that he misses the framework of uh, this systematic and consequent line of thought, then it becomes increasingly difficult uh, for him or her to accept the opposition on which Frisch's novel rests upon. The science, calculability and control on the one side, and the literature, prey and freedom on the other side, uh, and of course philosophy, which in its irreducibility to either of uh, these domains, circulates in between them and thinks through their relation. Despite all of their dis respective differences, science, philosophy and literature are similar because they share fiction as their common ground. Fiction is necessary for execution of a plot point, uh, formulation of the hypothesis that needs to be tested on the empirical material, and the development of, of ideas whose elaboration requires a novel way of argumentation. It is not m uh, my ambition here to dwell uh, too much on the common ground of these domains. On the contrary, I'm going to try to increase the re resolution of the image, which shows difference between them. I'll try to give an account for some of the reasons of their delimitation, and in the end, I'll sketch a different relation between them than the one proposed by Heidegger, post-Heideggerian philosophy by cursory pointing to the word of Kantame Asu. Let me uh, first try to explain why there comes uh, to the separation and delimitation between philosophy and literature. Does this question risk uh, to succumb to uh, uh, anachronism? I don't think it does. I think it's a perennial question. One of the most vivid description of the earth scene of this separation and the most precise formulation of its origin was given uh, by Barbara Kassan, who sees it as a consequence of Aristotle's refutation of the Sophists. The categories she uses in order to give account of it are binary opposition, true, false, and existence. The argument can be summarized in the following way. When one speaks, the meaning of the word expresses the essence of the thing. This is the case when the thing exists. The essence of the entities is the meaning of the world that refers to it. Aristotle, faced with the sophists who put a trace ontology as a discourse on being qua being, responded in a novel way and the manner that opened a radically new possibility for thinking. One is no longer forced to speak of something that exists in order to mean something. One can very well speak of the uh, non-existent things without putting ontology at risk. One can uh, speak non-being, Kassan claims, because one can speak non-being, because with the language of possibility comes a meaning that is no longer bound to reference. The truth may be uttered when we speak about things that do not exist. Aristotelian semantics produces possible words in which uh, true sentences assign non-existent predicates to non-beings, stemming uh, not from the false which is, but from the true which is not. By speaking of things that have no existence, 
by discarding the physical or phenomenal, phenomenal reference, one has opened up the possibility of promoting meaning alone, meaning itself, that is to say, the literature. The literature with the novel as the nascent genre and the parad paradigm of the sort was a creative way of answering to the earlier philosophical prohibition. The novel is the way of speaking which does not uh, want to conform the requirements of the ontological adequation. It is the self-conscious pseudos that presents itself as such. It is a proud self-manifestation of the speaking for the pleasure of speaking. A fiction which does not primarily want to capture reality even when, when it effectively does so. I think of the Aristotle's reputation of the Sopis as a promising star for thinking of the reasons for the separation of, philo uh, of philosophy from literature because it provides us with a firm grasp of the hierarchi hierarchical relation which is established uh, between the, uh, these two domains. The philosophy is deemed more worthy, by philosophy of course, of the two because it's, it is subjected to the pursuit of truth, uh, while the literature is subjected uh, to the pleasure. It is lagging in logo karim, speaking for the pleasure of speaking, speaking for its own sake. From there on, the content and exchange between philosophy and literature presumes the reactivation of the silent, implicit, but firmly established hierarchies. Philosophy deals with the ideas pertaining to reality, while literature can, in some cases, help it to convey these complex ideas in the form of story, and by doing so, uh, make them relatable to the non-philosophers. As far as the matters of the truth uh, of that which is, the matters of reality are concerned, the literature can have at best a didactic <coughs> function. The separation of science from philosophy, or at least science from metaphysics, came up, uh, about with the revolution of methodology of thinking about reality. The backbone of the, uh, uh, that revolution were induction and the experiment. Science has repeatedly proven itself to be superior to metaphysics in discovering and explaining fun uh, fundamental elements of reality because it has given us uh, new ways to rationally choose and privilege one hypothesis about the nature or reality or that which is be beyond reality over others. Uh, uh, Kant's first critique was, among other things, the acknowledgement and the ratification of science primacy over metaphysics as the first philosophy in the domain of knowledge. It was he who, without any hesitation and the most thorough fashion, provided the count of science superiority over metaphysics. Since Kant, metaphysics has uh, been forced to revise its claim to be in the possession of theoretical knowledge of realities that are equal or even superior to those known by the sciences. And since Kant, philosophers in general have accustomed to the idea that science and science alone provides us with a ther theoretical knowledge of nature, and even more importantly, uh, that metaphysic, metaphysics can no longer present itself as harboring knowledge of a supposedly higher reality than the reality accessible to us by means of empirical sciences. The consequence of this succession was the pressing need to rethink the object and the task of philosophy. With regards to the positioning vis-a-vis -vis science, uh, two different pa paths were taken. Kant and uh, his successors uh, have put the transcendental subject on the empty place of the subject of the object of philosophy. Uh, by doing so, they have taken on themselves the task of exploring the conditions of possibility of modern science, its thinkability. Philosophy has, has changed its object. She could not uh, longer talk about reality, but only about the conditions, grounds, methods, and implications of the sciences that study the apparent empirical reality. It is of less importance whether these conditions of science are taken to be something dependable on the trans transcendental subject, language, horizon of uh, thinkability, their combination, or something else. Some philosophers, on the other hand, did not accept the transcendental framework and did not take part in the critique of metaphysics. Consequently, for them, the object and the task of philosophy had not really changed. They continued to build metaphysics, but now their uh, thinking was informed and relied uh, on the scientific findings. Uh, that has proven itself to be a shaky ground. Science advances by devising hypotheses, which are in the constant process of revision. 
they are all sooner or later modified, discarded and forgotten and in result so are metaphysics erected on their foundations. Maybe it is true that every metaphysics device and advanced without taking an interest in the science of its time has to perish, but it's equally true to say that the same destiny awaits any metaphysics which grounds itself uh, in the science of its day. Of its day. Quantum is, uh, in an interesting way, redefines the relationship between philosophy, science and literature. In a very sketchy way, I will present his under, uh, understanding of the relations between, between these domains, starting from uh, his account of the object and the task of philosophy. To put it briefly, Masu does not see philosophy as a kind of meta-discourse which comments upon other discourses and connects them with one another, but, is, uh, but he is on, of opinion that the philosophy has its object, uh, which is traditional of metaphysics, the thing in itself. What is, by Masu account, the thing in itself? Uh, let us start with negative determinations. The thing in itself is not some fact, whether thing or event, that we know is capable of not being. The thing is in itself is also not a fact that uh, uh, whose not, not being or its being other we can conceive of, but of which we do not know whether it can actually be other than it is. And the last but not the least, the thing in itself is not a fact which we cannot in any way conceive of as being other than it is, or as not being, and whose necessity we nevertheless cannot prove. In the post-Kantian era, science was de dedicated to analysis of the uh, first two types of fact, uh, the ones whose not being we can at least conceive of, while philosophy took up the task of describing the facts that we cannot conceive of not being. Masu proceeds by noticing the lack of reason for any fact, which is to say the impossibility of giving an ultimate ground to the existence of facts and calls this lack of reason facticity. The lack of reason for any object, facticity, becomes the object of philosophy. So philosophy has an exclusive object that belongs exclusively to it. Masu calls fa uh, uh, factiality, factiality, facticity's property of not itself being factual. Factiality designates the non-facticity or the absolute necessity of facticity and uh, of facticity alone. The test of philosophy bec therefore becomes to think through the implications of uh, factiality. Philosophy, by trying to think the thing in itself, becomes the, dis uh, the discourse on factiali factiality, which is to say, the discourse on the necessity of con uh, contingency, the discourse dedicated to the deduction of the non-trivial con consequences of that necessity. We are now in position to raise the questions about the divisional labor between <laughs> philosophy, si uh, philosophy, science and literature. According to Masu, each of these respective domains is irreducible to any of the others. Each of them has its own domain, its own features, and there is no hierarchy among them. Philosophy is interested in the non-empirical, in what may be, and not in what there is. If one wants to think or know what is, one must pass by a, a way of a certain regime of the empirical understood in the broadest sense. <coughs> scientific experimentation in the case of natural sciences and the experience of pure singularity in the case of literature. What is meant here by pure singularity? Measu does not elaborate on this notion, so one is obliged here to fill in the gap by proposing different solutions. Uh, where, are we, where are we to look for help? My provisional, tentative, revisable, and let us admit, uh, let us admit it straightforwardly, misguided proposition is that we return to Kant. I'm inclined to do so because it gives me a straightforward answer to the question on which Measu remains silent. Literary experience may be the experience of singularity, all well and good, but whose experience is it? Who is the subject of that experience? The author of the literary work or its reader? I'm opting primarily for the reader. In the third critique, Kant defines the aesthetic art as the art that prompts the animation of the senses and intends directly to arouse the feeling of pleasure. He then parses out two distinct categories of the aesthetic art, fine art and the agreeable art. 
Fine, art, uh, fine arts are those who are distinguished by their communicability. The agreeable arts, on the other hand, are those whose purpose is merely to please. Pleasure is a passive reception of some sensible object. It can be received by reading a good book or, why not, looking a football match. There is no assertion of universal validity when speaking of bon agreeable. The same book can uh, give some reader immense pleasure and leave the other uh, one indifferent. All of these things that are subsumed under the rubric of agreeable art are concerned uh, with entertainment of the moment, not any material for future meditation. Kant clearly values fine art more than agreeable arts. And he describes uh, the latter using the derogatory terms like mer. But for uh, me, there is nothing mer about pleasure, which we obtain by encouraging agreeable art, uh, by countering agreeable art. I think of literature as the first and foremost agreeable art. Aristotle's refutation of the sophist in metaphysics can, retrospectively, be read as the ur scene of the separation of literature from philosophy. Sophists, the one who speak for the pleasure of speaking, were banished uh, from the philosophical community and they were consigned to literature. Philosophy and uh, pleasure share the intimate link from the very start. There is nothing more singular than a pleasure, and that is why I'm equating it uh, with the experience of pure singularity that Meassou mentions while discussing literature, but never elaborates on. Meassou does philosophy. If he decides to evoke literature or science in order to use their methods or results, then he is doing that for a purely didactical purposes. Nevertheless, this didacticism still does not activate all the well-known hierarchies. I will point out to the two examples taken from his over that confirm this thesis. My first example is concerned with the instrumentalization of the science of chronological dating within the debate of Arche Fossa in the first chapter of After Finity. What is the purpose of bringing out the scientific results that point out to the time anterior to the emergence of consciousness and human temporality? It is merely a propedeutic tool that enables an uninitiated to get some sense of the necessity and relevance of his philosophical endeavor. Masu spo only spoke of the science of dating and the of the arche fossil uh, so as to awaken uh, the reader, uh, reader's consciousness to the fact that Kant's tra transcendental philosophy and the phenomenology as its su successor had a, uh, as its rigorous consequence to make discourse of the science meaningless. The, the aporia of the Arche Fossil culminated in the following proposition. The first condition of the thinkability of science ter turned out to be the abandonment of the very transcendental whose vocation was to investigate the conditions of possibility of science. Masu readers thus found out that, far from being an intrinsically transcendental concept, the notion of condition could propel them to abandon the transcendental. What should not uh, be left unnoticed is, as Masu himself points out in the final chapter of After Finitude, is that science could have discovered that, indeed, nothing actually precedes the emergence of consciousness it would not be of any importance. Masu's work would not be in danger of collapsing, nor would the, uh, his project be any less uh, needed. He would have lost one didactical tool, a pow powerful illustration, but nevertheless only an illustration whose importance should not be overestimated. In this case, philosophical development does not depend on the scientific discovery, nor would different scientific discovery make philosophy obsolete. My other example is uh, the instrumentalization of literature at a work in the text called Subtraction and Contraction. Uh, in this interesting work, Masu brackets the whole of Deleuze over, invites us to do the same, and proceeds by imagining the world in which uh, we would have at our, at our disposal only one remaining fragment of that over, taken from the book What is Philosophy, that contains rather cryptic remarks dedicated to the concept of immanence. There is no way for us to figure out what uh, Deleuze invokes uh, with, the terms immanent, with the term immanence solely on the basis of that fragment. However, not all hope is lost. The, f the fragment references Spinoza and Bergson, Bergson as the two princes of immanence 
whose complete works are saved. Close reading of Ber Bergson by way of following Deleuze as a remark from that fragment could navigate us toward a, a reconstruction of the Deleuze understanding of immanence. The, uh, the clue that helps us the most is the fact that Deleuze tells exactly up until uh, which point his understanding of immanence rhymes with Bergson's understanding and where Bergson falters, uh, thereby risking the collapse of his thought back into the transcendental philosophy he sought to render unnecessary. The game is set up so that uh, the task of Masu, uh, and by proxy his readers, is to correct Bergson's mistake and proceed with caution toward the formulation of the theory of immanence. The final result would uh, be neither Bergson's nor Deleuze's theory, but a new fictional theory that should be in all of its essential elements similar to Deleuze's original theory. Why does Masu act like a writer? What is the point of imagining the world in which Deleuze's over has been lost? Why he, uh, is he incited to formulate a fictional theory when he already has on his disposal rich and complete the theory of immanence? The reasons for this undertaking are purely, purely didactical in nature. It can help someone who is not familiar with Deleuze's theory uh, of immanence to get a better grasp of the problem which incited its inception and the res resolution of that problem. To truly understand the work of some philo philosopher requires, among other things, the ability to deduce the complete, complete system from the central formula of that system, captured, maybe, in some significant fragment. Masu's fictional theory that functions as a simplified model of Deleuze's original theory should shed a light on the connection between many essential aspects of Deleuze's thinking and testify about its coherence. Mas uh, Masu's didactics, when it comes to literature, is not always so inventive. When he, does, uh, he does not always build fictional theories, but simply borrows the material from fiction in order to illustrate his thesis. This is the case in the essay called Science Fiction and Exercise Fiction. Before I lay out the way in which Masu uses the literature in that text, I again have to render Kant as his main dialogical <coughs> partner and adversary. In the critique of pure reason, Kant, while trying to answer Hume's skeptical challenge, claims that the cons uh, consciousness would not be possible without the order of appearances governed by a set of necessary laws. Kant wants to say that the conditions of science and the conditions of consciousness are identical. We would surely not be able to conduct scientific experience in the world if uh, we were not conscious of it, but the crux of Kant uh, argumentation is located in the reversal of that claim. We would not be conscious if the world was not always already uh, susceptible to scientific experimentation. Masu takes issue with Kant and argues that there could be a world in which we could be conscious, uh, in which there could be consciousness, but uh, we could not practice science because the science as such uh, would not be possible. He criticizes Kant's identification of the conditions of consciousness with the conditions of sciences by pointing out to the Kant's implicit mathematical reasoning he finds flawed in a way reminiscent of the fourth chapter of After Finitude. But in doing so, he does not simply repeat the older version of the argument, but expands it by envisaging the existence of non-Kantian worlds uh, outside science or simply extra-scientific worlds. There are three types of the worlds in which science ceases to be possible. The first type uh, is one in which uh, the contingency of uh, natural laws is rare occurrence of the local character that actually neither science nor consciousness is affected by what appear to be ex uh, ex some glitch in the fabric of the real reality. The paradigm of this kind of world would, would be a world in which something akin to miracle occurs. The third type of the world is, a world, uh, is not a world at all. It's a pure chaos, uh, entirely a frenetic disorder, a madness in which nothing can subsist uh, and in which consciousness, like science, would not be possible at all. These types of world offer little that is, inter uh, that is of interest to Masu in debate with Kant, of course, but the second type does seem promising. It is the one in which the contingency of natural laws is extreme enough to shake the scientific enterprise, but not the possibility of consciousness. In such a world, 
natural laws would take on the character of the statistical trends and would totally lack the necessity uh, that Kant uh, had claimed for them. The second type serves as Masu's entry point into the domain of literary studies. By proposing extra scientific fiction as the new category and the criterion for its usage, he has shown that the literary studies could find uh, his philosophical work useful. Comparison of his procedure with the procedure uh, at work within the founding text of narratology reveals that he acted more like a Roland Barthes than Vladimir Propp. Propp used the inductive method and moved from the particular to the general by way of extraction the simple and useful elements and regularities from the seemingly heterogeneous material within the corpus of fairy tales. Bart, whose objects uh, were not the texts belonging to one genre, but all, na but all the narrative texts, had to act differently. Uh, he started with the general model, which he uh, had borrowed from linguistics, and then proceeded to the analysis of particular texts. By his account, it was necessary first to presuppose structural identity of the narrative texts, their hidden sameness, uh, then to see if the general model corresponds to the particular empirical material, just in order to gradually rediscover the differences between the texts and to read them once again in their uh, plurality. Uh, Masu also has a, a general model which he devised as a philosopher within his philosophical pro project and offered to literary typ typology and genre theory. He separates scientific worlds from extra-scientific worlds and on that basis suggests the foundation of extra-science uh, extra fiction as a new genre. Whether some literary work belongs to that genre will be determined by the features of its diegetic world. If the science in the world of the literary work is impossible and not only unknown, then the work belongs within the confines of the genre of this extra science fiction. To conclude, extra science fiction is the special regime of imagination in which the structure, or rather destructure imagined worlds, are envisaged as the worlds in which experimental science cannot constitute its objects, uh, test uh, its hypotheses, nor uh, elaborate its theories. The scientific outlook in the extra uh, scientific world remains necessary, but only as a negative, which highlights the radical contingency and the unthinkability of the events within it. These diegetic worlds are identical to the second type of non Kantian worlds. The fictional work of Luca Bekovac so far includes three. Okay, now I'm obviously uh, switching to Luca Bekovac. <laughs> Uh, the fictional work of Luca Becker so far includes three novels and uh, one collection of stories. All of these fictional works seem to belong to the same diegetic world, which is marked by weird occurrences. The flow of time is occasionally suspended, the arrow of time changes its direction, bioacoustical noise transmits messages from uh, some other side, there is a communication with the worlds uh, parallel to this diegetic world. That world, which is so far, uh, which is so far defined by a few Slavonian Baranian muni municipalities, is marked by the some kind of catastrophe, which is destroying the biosphere, but whose nature and rage, in, uh, range uh, is not at all clear to the characters in the novels nor the readers of the novels. There is no clear uh, articulation of the connection between this catastrophe and the strange occurrences, occurrences, but the catastrophe has been theorized in all sorts of ways. Uh, Bekhavis uses internally fixed vocalization, and the character of, of Professor Markovic, who purportedly has the most firm grasp of the catastrophe and has developed scientifically formalized description of it, is never a, f uh, a vocalization point. We know about him and his theory is only uh, what the other characters, mostly unreliable narrators, know. Under the guise and uh, with the alibi uh, of the bioacoustical project, Markovic analyzes th uh, this strange noise. He considers uh, uh, this noise, we know that much, uh, as the total arhai within, the, within which the certification of existence does not correspond to our living experience. Within the human exper uh, experience here, every moment is unique and we pass through it in a straight line and without possibility of returning to the previous points. Over there, 
figuratively speaking, of course, every moment can be approached uh, from multiple directions because it does not simply pass away. It does not come or pass at all. It just is. Markov's scientific apparatus, which he's trying to apply in the analysis of the recordings gathered in the Bahrainian locations in order to decrypt messages sent from the other frequential range, does not provide unambiguous results. One cannot determine the soundness of his theories, and the characters of these novels and short stories have every right to find them dubious. The analytical, cold and disinterest perspective is presented to us only in traces in remarks, commentaries, scribbles and indices of some formalized theory, but never in its complete form or through the confirmation of its predictive power within the confines of the diegetic world. The value of Markovich theories uh, within the diegetic world remains suspicious. Uh, science, as we can tell, could be impossible, and the theories could be illusions in the way that the personal experience of the char characters <coughs> cannot be. It is uh, at least certain to be real, even though it is not, and maybe it cannot be, fully mapped and articulated. Is the diegetic world that Beckowitz created exoscientific world within uh, which the laws of nature are changing, or is it scientific Popperian world in which the recent events uh, have not been inscribed within the scientific order, but their inscription could be just a matter of time? We cannot determine it, and since we cannot determine it, we cannot claim that his uh, prosaic work, works belong to the genre of exoscience fiction. Do, the, do these texts belong to uh, some specific genre at all? Before I answer that question, I have to say a little bit more about Be uh, the work of Bekavac. So, by relying on the author as the principle of unica unification of the heterogene heterogeneous textual material, I will describe his work as the contemporary and funny. I will back up these qualifications through, uh, through the analysis of Bekova's usage of metalepsis. Before I do that, I will invoke the novel Name of the Rose, the most famous novel of Roberto Eco. It's a novel in which uh, the three monks, hidden behind the walls of the abbey, read the second book of Aristotle Poetics, a volume dedicated to comedy. The monks do not know that the pages of the book have, Im uh, have been uh, impregnated in poison. The mechanics of reading look like this. Uh, look like this. The, uh, the monks automatically move their fingers toward their tongues, they soften them with saliva, and they move them back toward the book in order to turn uh, its poisonous pages. The more time they spend the, uh, the reading the book, the more pleasure they obtain. It is this pleasure that is lethal. By reading the book, by laughing and enjoying themselves, they participate in their own undoing. What do I mean when I describe Beckowitz as a contemporary author? I mean primarily on the fact that uh, his work belongs to the theoretical fiction as the genre in nascent. His writings have been uh, uh, described as the superior narratives which are made uh, by the combina combination of the elements taken from science fiction, horror and thriller, but the narratives that nevertheless stay reducible to any of these genres and their patterns. It would seem um, imprudent to add to this list another uh, genre label, especially the label of the genre whose definition has not yet been uh, provided. I will describe Beckowitz's fiction as a theoretical fiction because I am of the opinion that this label could direct us toward better understanding of his work. Let me first lay out my th theoretical presuppositions. I approach the literary genre from the standpoint of its reception. This approach takes literary genre to be, to put it broadly, classificatory category that is stabilized within some community after sedimentation of reading experience and the implicit uh, systematization of the expectation for, uh, from some literary work. The problem with the definition of uh, some particular genre is its fluidity. The definition changes with the changes of the works themselves and the reader's expectations from them. So the definition of a genre, some particular genre, uh, uh, given by the standards of, of classical logic, which would fix necessary and sufficient conditions of some genre, is not to be expected here. As we have seen, 
uh, science fiction in its core state uh, would, be, would be the genre whose uh, diegetic world is built as the alternative to everyday affairs by way of introducing weird occurrences that can nevertheless be explained within the confines of science of that diegetic world. The diegetic world of Bekova's novels has been marked with the anomalies whose origins and nature uh, continually evades the understanding of the hab habitants of that world. It is uh, the impossibility of the scientific method to approach these anomalies and to uh, give account of them that is forcing us to try to find more suitable genre for these stories. After discarding science fiction and extra science fiction as well, as the suitable framers for approaching Bekava's novels, we could try to think of his writings as horror novels. It would uh, make sense to do so because uh, of the horror, both the weird and the eerie, as their Grundstimmung. The feel of uneasiness of the characters before the space-time anomaly is due to their uh, failed attempts to connect their experiences with, uh, within some uh, conceptual order and due to the lack uh, of vocabulary to describe uh, this catastrophe that is affecting them. The horror is nevertheless a secondary feature. I find the more pertinent the fact that characters are still continually attempting to analyze the cracks of their world and their strange predicament than the fact that their attempts uh, usually results in a, fa in a failure which makes them terrified. My suggestion runs as follows. If series of novels which share, uh, share the same diegetic world do not belong neither to science fiction nor to horror, then maybe we can recognize them as the examples of theoretical fiction as a new genre. I described earlier theoretical fiction as the nas nascent genre. Every beginning is hard. To say that the genre is nascent, to claim that it is under construction, is very problematic expression because it co uh, confronts us di directly with the Minos paradox, which states the following. If we do not know how the object we are looking for looks like, then we will not recognize it when we encounter it. If on the other hand, we know how the object looks like, then there is no need for us to look for it in the first place. In other words, without the possession of the operative concept of the theoretical fiction, we would not be able to recognize some text as a theoretical fiction. On the other hand, the possession of the concept of the theoretical fiction renders reading and analyzing the various texts in order to determine the features of the genre unnecessary. The only thing of concern in that case would be the correct application of the concept to the fictional material. So, how are we to start? Uh, lucky for me, uh, the genre is not the concept. So. Uh, uh, the solution of our problem is the partiality of our knowledge, which is accompanied by the partiality of the thing itself. We do not know everything about the nascent genre, that's true, but that doesn't uh, uh, mean we know nothing about it. We do know, what we do know is the fact uh, that uh, the last decade brought about the publication of the several texts that do not fit the existing categories and resemble each other in a de degree which propels one to look for a new genre label under which they could be subsumed. This process has not ended yet. Bekovac recognizes it and makes a conscious effort to influence and define, by way of his novelistic work, what could be that what could be assumed uh, under the label in the future. It's an ambitious project. How many writers can tell that they are trying to set a new task before literature, that they want to establish new set of rules in their domain? Uh, the basis of theoretical fiction is the relationship between literature and theory. The literature now has the instrumental relation toward the theory. Theoretical fiction overturns the usual hierarchy between these two domains. It's philosophy or theory who usually use the art as a mean of illustration of its thesis, while in theoretical fiction the art of words uses philosophical and theoretical position, positions, le lexics, uh, ideas as a material or simply style as a material for con construction of the aegetic world as a frame in which si situations, characters and relations between them can be seen as coexisting. Bekovac certainly pr uh, proceeds in this way. His characters are laying out the rudiments of the theory in different formats, in some cases even parts of something that seemed like a complete and formalist theory. Narration is developed 
by their attempts to understand what uh, was happening or is happening on the locations of Barayam. Maybe even narration would be too strong of a word, because the story does not really progress by a narration of uh, some sensical chain of events, but uh, by a way of description of the defamiliarized world in which something is happening. That something uh, happens would also be too imprecise, because it's, uh, it is the possibility of the determination of the chronology of events, fabula as a causal linkage of the events abstracted from sujet that now seems problematic maybe even impossible. What do I mean when I say that Pekovac is funny? The humor in his work is always in the background and it never undercuts horror as the dominant emotional tone. To get a joke in his work, you occasionally need to recognize that it belongs to the genre of theoretical fiction. Gallery of the Visual Arts in Osijek, the collection of source, short stories, belongs to this genre and it seems that its author wants its reader to recognize this fact. The book is full of different references to the writers who have been uh, mentioned in the context of theoretical fiction. Three examples, uh, examples uh, will suffice. The influence of Tom McCarthy is again on display here, although the uh, resonances with his work are weaker than in the last two novels when the ideas of radio emission, instrumental transcommunication, and steganography were prominent. McCarthy and Bekovac share the same uh, fascination with uh, Cocteau. Cocteau's Orpheus has served as a kind of hypertext for both of them in their respective novels. Reza Negastani, uh, the author of Cyclonopedia, the early text of uh, theory fiction, is mentioned here by name. In one of the stories with Ballardian undertone, the narrator describes the symposium organized to mark the 20 uh, years from the publication of Negaristani's book. In the near future of Begkava's diegetic world, the theoretical fiction is established as well uh, as a well-respected genre, and Cyclonopedia seems to be a classic whose eminence is so great that is honored at the very fringes of the academic world. One could claim that this is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. This kind of prophecy will play an uh, even more prominent role when Bekovac, this time without invoking any names, uses hyperstition as the formal innovation of notorious uh, Nick Land. Here's an example. On the last pages of the gallery, in the story called Net, there is a scene set up in the future where the Faculty of Electrical Engineering changes its name to Ev Evangelical Theological Faculty. If Bekovac were a lesser writer, this would re remain just an allusion to the current political climate in Croatia, or, if you like it, a premonition of the ultimate consequences of the cler clericalization of the public dis discourse and its infiltration in the sphere of public education. In any case, uh, a marker of contemporaneity. But the dean of this bastard faculty ends up uh, his address to the students with the following words. Messiah will maybe be a machine and we have to build it, just as God still does not exist but could one day to come about. This sentence still points to contemporaneous, but the contemporaneous that is not determined by the miserable state of Croatian public discourse. It points to the contemporaneous whose horizon is defined by the peculiar reception of some philosophers. Bekovac does not hint to them in passing in order to make happy the few initiated readers. No. This sentence is in the service of Bekovac's killing joke. It's, uh, it is his closing word in the debate whether literature should be socially engaged and demonstration of the impact of that engagement by way of satiric performative. Bekovac instrumentalizes his own literary creation for the extra literary purposes without writing a single word. He presupposes the complicity of his reader and tricks him by using a kind of ontological metalepsis, the act of undermining the separation between narration and the story, a strange loop in the structure of narrative levels or a short circuit between fictional world and the ontological level occupied by the author. Let me explain how he has been able to put, pull, off that, pull uh, that off. Dean's sentence is the amalgam of the two ideas worthy of the closer look. In the second part of uh, this, his sentence about the God who does not yet exist, but could come about, is a direct reference to Measu and his thesis on in the uh, inexistent God. According to Measu, we can be uh, uh, the condition 
of the world of justice without being its cause. The advent of Messiah as a justice uh, depends on us, but this dependence is not causal in nature. The believers cannot do anything in order to provoke the advent of Messiah, but to hope for its arrival. However, their hope is not simply worthless because it represents the formal condition for the advent of the world of justice. The believers have to accept the Messiah's glorious arrival and demand justice. Without their expe expectance, uh, the coming of Messiah would mean nothing to anyone, and the justice that was not demanded would not be anything but a fortuitous occurrence, so it wouldn't be justice at all. Masu's divinology, one of the most bizarre parts of his philosophy, has become the dominant ecclesic ecclesiastical idea in Bekava's diegetic world. However, the first part of the Dean's sentence shows us that uh, he has a rather interesting interpretation of it. The Dean talks about the possibility to act causally and to make uh, the machinic messiah. That looks very much like a hyperstitional argument according to which the existence of, be uh, of belief in something is itself enough to bring about contents of that belief. This is the requisite for Becker's meta-literary commentary. His stories are usually full of technical nomenclature and his implicit reader is often confronted with very high demands. The standard uh, demand of the work addressed to its implicit reader is to often look for the references outside the work which may or may not be helpful for understanding it. They usually aren't, they're just obfuscating and mystificatory. Uh, confronted with the cryptic sentence is the, in the Dean address, which comes at the end of the book, structurally the most important place, the reader will probably want to trace its origin and, judging by my own experience, come to the encyclopedic entry called Rocco's Basilisk. This is one of the most famous examples of hyperstitional fiction, a recontextualized version of Pascal's wager, a thought experiment about the potential risks, risks involved in developing artificial intelligence. The premise of the thought experiment is that an all-powerful artificial intelligence from the future could retroactively punish those who did not help uh, to bring about its existence, including those who merely knew about the possible development of such a being. It would do so, the theory goes, because one of its objectives would be to prevent existential risks, but it could do uh, that most effectively not merely by preventing um, risk in the present, by also, but by also reaching back into the past to punish people who weren't effective altruists. The artificial intelligence and the person punished need, uh, need uh, have no causal interaction, and the punished individual may have died decades or centuries earlier. Instead, the artificial intelligence could punish a simulation of the person, which uh, it would construct by deduction for the first principles. The moral imperative of the basilisk becomes punishing you or your, your resurrected simulation because of the fear of eventual punishment increases the chance that you will now, without hesitation, act to, uh, to pave the way for the omnipotent intelligence which brings about the world of justice. Mess Messiah does not yet exist, but it could come about in the future and it makes more sense as Pascal reasoned, to act like it will happen than to simply ignore the possibility. The machine messiah could come about. Bekavas knows that his reader will come to know it, now you know it, and the messiah could eventually know that you have known about this, uh, his future advent. Pay the way for his arrival or resurrect just in order to be tortured for the whole eternity. Bekavas' book is much worse than Echo's book. The latter told us that the story about the dangers of taking pleasure in reading, while the former used our habit of taking pleasure in reading and put us all in danger. The literature may be pseudo, but the pleasure we take in it is never more.